Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you very much for the Bible study today. We bless your name because of your goodness. Thank you very much because you brought us together so that your word will enrich our lives. We are praying, Lord, that you touch everyone, touch every family, and touch the whole church so that these words we're hearing will have real definite influence upon our lives in Jesus' name. We thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. I welcome you once again to the Bible study today. It's always a joyful time when we come to study the Word of God. The time I spend in studying the Word myself, even if I wasn't going to teach, is so enriching and so wonderful that you'll enjoy every verse and every word that we're going to read in this uh, passage. The Lord is writing to the church, and he's writing to the leadership in the church, and writing to the membership of the church as well. We know that the Lord has written through John the Beloved unto the seven churches in Asia Minor. And we started the study of the messages of the churches last week. And today we come to the message of the second church. I'm reading to you from Revelation chapter 2 verse 8. And unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write. I'm stopping there for a moment. To the angel of the church of Smyrna write. I want you to understand that the message is not limited to the angel of the church. Actually, the Lord had the message for everyone. Go back to Revelation chapter 1, verse 11. Saying, I'm Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. What thou seest, write in a book. And send ye to the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, unto Smyrna, unto Pagamos, unto Tatyra, unto Sardis, unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. And you will see in that chapter 1, verse 11, it says, You send a message to the churches. So it's not limited to the angel of the church. Come back to chapter 2 and verse 8. And unto the angel of the church in Smyrna, write, The thing says, says the first. And the last, which was dead and is alive, I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but at the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. Now, as you begin this letter, this epistle, this message, coming from the Lord Jesus Christ unto the church. You understand? It's the head of the church. It's the one that gave his blood so that we can be saved, so that we can be brought out of the world into the kingdom of God. It's the one that has purchased us, that has a right to speak to us, that is speaking to the church here. And it says, and unto the angel of the church is man. If you were here last week, I explained to you that that's what angel there is the messenger of the church, the pastor in the church. You say, why? Is he that he's called an angel? Well, that language has been used in the Old Testament to show the leadership of the people of Israel. Look at Second Samuel chapter 14, reading there in verse 17. Then Dan had me said, The watch of my Lord the King shall now be comfortable, for as an angel of God, so is my Lord the King. You see this, uh, the leadership of Israel, the King of Israel, the Lord in Israel, the one that is shepherding Israel, was compared to an angel. But why? To discern good and bad. Therefore the Lord thy God be with thee. If we turn to verse 20 to fetch about this form of speech. As thy servant Joab done this sin, my Lord is wise according to the wisdom of an angel of God to know all things that are in the earth. And you will understand then when Jesus said, is writing this epistle, is giving this message to the angel of the church in Smyrna. He's talking about the leader of the church in Smyrna. Please come back to Revelation. I'm looking at chapter 2 and in verse 8. It says, and unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write. 
Now, because you've been coming here for a long time, and you've been reading the Bible for a long time, and you feel that you know what the church means, you may not think it's necessary to explain to you what the Lord Jesus Christ meant by church. Because you know there are many people that think that church is a building. They think that the church is the denomination. But what's the church, by the way? Please go to Acts of the Apostles, chapter 7. Acts chapter 7, reading verse 38. This is he which was in the church in the wilderness with the angel which spake to him in the Mount Sinai and with our fathers who received the lively oracles to give to us. You find here it refers to the children of Israel as they came out of Egypt. And then they were going through the wilderness and they were going to the land of Canaan. It referred to them as the church. This is he. That was in the church, in the wilderness. Now the church in the wilderness, what's the word that describes them? That makes us to understand what a church is. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 23. And he brought us out from thence, that he might bring us in to give us the land which is swear unto our fathers. That's the church. Out, in out of Egypt, so that we can get to the land of Canaan, out of the kingdom of darkness, so we can come into the kingdom of light, out of our sin, so we can come into the Savior, out of, out of, those who are called out, out of darkness, out of their sin, out of the world, that is the church. And they have the purpose of walking through and moving through so that they'll be able to get to the land that the Lord has provided for us in my father's house and many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Whenever we're talking about the church, you need to understand there are the people that are called out so that they can get in. In First Peter chapter 2. First Peter chapter 2, I'm reading verse 9. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, an holy nation, a peculiar people. Listen to this. That ye should show forth the praise of him who has called you out. That's the church. In John chapter 15 verse 19. If ye were of the world, the world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you, call you out of the world therefore the world hates you out of the world whenever you see that that you are selected you are chosen and you are called out and you are taken out of the world so that you can have fellowship with the lord that is the church in john chapter 17 verse 6 i've manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world that's the church they came to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and they were called out of the world. It says, I've manifested your name unto them, unto these men, which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me. They were yours by creation. Now they are mine by redemption, and they have kept thy word. If anybody wants to be part of the church, and he wants to remain really in the church, what happens? What does he do? Look at it in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 17 and 18. Wherefore, come out. That's how to be part of the church. You cannot remain in the world, and remain in your sin, and remain in darkness, and remain in evil, and say so you are part of the church. Wherefore, come out among them. And be ye separate, says the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Would you come to Revelation chapter 2? In Revelation chapter 2, I'm reading to you once again from verse 8. Now you know what Jesus Christ meant by the angel, and the angel of the church. The church is a called out people. They are out of sin. And they come to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Unto the angel of the church is man right. These things says the first and the last, which was dead, and is alive. I know thy works, thy tribulation, thy poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them, which say they are Jews, and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of those things, which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried. And ye shall have tribulation ten days, be thou faithful unto death, and I will give you a crown of life. Have you noticed something here? 
Have you noticed that, number one, Jesus had no watch of condemnation, no watch of correction. They pleased the Lord. He said, I know, I see you, and I know what you are going through. And then what did he say? He knew. One, he knew their tribulation. And he knew their poverty, that's still suffering. And he knew the blasphemy and the slander that some people were saying against them. And then he said, he knew they were receiving some pressures from the synagogue of Satan. And then he said, he told them, fear me, try to set in. Because, you see, when you're under pressure and poverty and persecution, and the tendency is that you may, you may be crushed under that pressure. And it may be so painful that you begin to be afraid of that synagogue of Satan. It says, fear not. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. There was suffering in that church. He said the devil shall cast some of you into prison so that there will be trial. You will be tried ten days. What does he mean by the ten days? I'll explain to you later. And then he says be faithful even if it has to be until death and then I will give you a crown of life. That's the church that was undergoing persecution. That's why the title of the message today is the power and the perseverance, the preservation of the persecuted church. This church in Smyrna was a persecuted church. Persecution actually purifies the church. Persecution does not destroy the church. You know why? No one wants to suffer for what he does not sincerely and wholeheartedly believe. Persecution produces something in the life of the church. What does it produce? Number one, purity. Number two, patience. Number three, perseverance. Number four, it produces spiritual strength. Number five, it produces spiritual power. Six, prayerfulness. And it brings conviction. And it brings self-examination. All these are the results of persecution. And so, if you are undergoing persecution... Don't count it a strange thing. And don't, uh, you know, be crying and mourning and saying, what's happening to me? That thing is there to develop you. And that thing is there to strengthen you. Uh, look at uh, Romans chapter 5. And see what persecution does. What suffering does. In Romans chapter 5, reading from verse 3. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also. Knowing that tribulation worketh patience. And patience experience. And experience hope. And hope maketh not ashamed. Because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. As we look at this study on this uh, church of Smyrna, we're looking at it under three subtitles. Uh, number one, proclamation by Christ, the first and the last. Number two, the persecution of Christ's faithful followers. Number three, promise from Christ for the fearless and faithful. I come to number one. Number one is the proclamation by Christ. The first and the last. Look at Revelation chapter two and see how Jesus Christ introduced himself to this church. Can I remind you that when John saw the Lord Jesus Christ in chapter one, he saw the glory of Christ, the majesty of Christ, and he saw the dominion of Christ. He saw that Christ was above all, the Son of God, the Son of Man, glorified Son of Man. And now he saw some details about the glorified Christ. And we've studied that already. When you come to chapters two and three, and you see the Lord introducing himself to the churches, he picked some of the qualities and characteristics and attributes that you find in chapter 1. And then he uses those things to introduce himself. How did he introduce himself to the church in Smyrna? Look at this in Revelation chapter 2 verse 8. And unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things says the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. You see that he introduced himself by saying, This is the first. And this is the last. He was dead and is alive again. Go back to chapter 1, verse 11. Saying, I'm Alpha and Omega. The first and the last. You see where Jesus Christ picked that introduction. Chapter 1, verse 17. And I saw him. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. If you look at Revelation chapter 22, the last chapter. In the first chapter, 
That's how he introduced himself, the first and the last. In the last chapter, this is how he introduced himself in verse 13. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. So then you understand how Jesus introduced himself as he presents himself to this church through the writing of John, the beloved, to the pastor, to the messenger, to the leader, to the preacher, to the angel of the church in Smyrna. He said, here, here are my titles. And he said, I am the first and I'm the last. Then he said, I'm he that was dead. And behold, I'm alive again, alive forevermore. Before we go to being dead and being alive, let's look at this, the first and the last. Do you know that Almighty God himself, Father God in heaven, that's exactly the way he spoke about himself to you. Look at um, Isaiah chapter 41. Isaiah chapter 41, reading there in verse 4. Who has wrought and done it, calling the generations from the beginning, I the Lord, the first and of the last, I am he. And something begins to strike you now. When Jesus said, I and my father are one. You understand? What the father said about himself, the son is saying about himself. When he said, he was seen me, has seen the father. That is, we're identical. And is the express image of the father. All the qualities of the ancient of days, all the qualities of the everlasting father, all the qualities of the God of glory you find in the Lord Jesus Christ. And you look at chapter 44. Isaiah chapter 44 and see what God says about himself. In verse 6, thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first, I am the last, and beside me there is no God. It's telling you that uh, if uh, somebody says, I am the first, I am the last, that means that individual is God. That means you are talking about divinity, about deity, about the eternal God. In chapter 48 of Isaiah, reading from verse 12, Hurkin unto me, O Jacob and Israel, my called. I am he, I am the first, I also, I am the last. Mine hand I also has laid the foundation of the earth, and my right hand has spanned the heavens. When I call unto them, they stand up together. Well, it's very clear to everyone reading the word of God that Jesus Christ claimed the same attribute claimed the same characteristic as the almighty God himself. That means then that Jesus Christ is equal to and equal with the Father. But as we come back to Revelation chapter 2, Revelation chapter 2, we're still looking at the proclamation by Jesus Christ, who is the first and the last. Revelation chapter 2 verse 8, And unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write, This thing says the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. That's referring to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. That Jesus Christ, yes, he was killed. Yes, he was crucified. And he was buried. But on the third day, he rose again. And you find that all over the scripture, that Jesus Christ died for our sins. And he rose for justification. In Revelation chapter 1 verse 18. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I live, I am alive forevermore. Everybody said, Amen. And as Peter was preaching, in the house of Cornelius, he emphasized the same thing. About the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. That the resurrection of Jesus Christ is not a hidden fact. This is something so very sure, so very definite. And those disciples saw him after he had risen from the dead. In Acts of the Apostles chapter 10. Reading from verse 39. And we are witnesses of all things which he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem. Whom they slew and hanged on a tree. That means he died. But in verse 40, him God raised up the third day and showed him openly. Not to all the people, that is not to the sinners in Jerusalem and Galilee. Like he showed himself when he came to this world. But he showed himself unto witnesses chosen before of God. Even to us, Peter included, the apostles of the Lord, who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. Peter was saying it was a definite fact that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. And in fact, we even ate with him. 
and we died with him after he rose from the dead. Therefore, when we talk about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we're not telling you fables. We're telling you something that is definite and something that is sure and something that is real. Uh, what's the implication of that? Because he lives, we shall live also. And no matter what you're going through, the life and the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ will walk in your mortal body because he's a prince of life and because he's a king of life. And he gives you life by the resurrection power that brought him to life. Hebrews chapter 7, reading verse 16. Who is made not after the law of a carnal commandment, but after the power of an endless life after the power of an endless life that means he lives and he lives forevermore and you will see as jesus introduced himself he introduced himself to this church according to the need of the church you know what the church was passing through i read it to you already the persecution the suffering and in fact jesus said be faithful unto death don't be afraid that there might be death that will result in this persecution, in the pressure that the devil was bringing upon you. But understand, I have overcome death in all its forms. I have triumphed over death in all its forms. And now I live forevermore. And because of that, I am able to make you conquer death and to also protect you from the second death. And that's the reason you need to understand that whatever you are going through, the Lord Jesus is with you. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. And while the people of the world may be thinking about death, about suffering, about pain on your behalf, the Lord is thinking about life. And you will live. I said you will live. In fact, when Jesus said, I am the first and the last, he meant he was eternal. As God the Father is eternal, even Jesus Christ too is eternal. He has always lived in all the past ages, the first. And he will continue to live all through the ages to come, the last. There is nothing that will outlast the Lord Jesus Christ. As long as anything remains, he will still be there because he is the last. Because of this, he assures Smanam and the church of today and the church anytime because i'm the first and because i'm the last i remember all my promises i remember all my plans all my purposes i remember i can accomplish all my purposes i can execute all my purposes he encouraged this church in smana as the lord of life and everything applied to the Lord Jesus Christ as the one that lives forevermore. And uh, he also told them that death has no more power over the Lord and over the people that he himself has redeemed. Death has no power over them anymore. Always alive. He can always sustain us in our persecution, in our suffering. And he can see to it that our trials will feel, fulfill their purpose. That instead of our trials destroying us, our trials and the strength of the Lord, by the grace of the Lord, by the power of the Lord, by the enablement of the Lord, instead of destroying us, will purge us, purify us, give us patience, make us to focus and concentrate on essential eternal things, give us spiritual strength and power, make us prayerful and prepare us for the second coming of the Lord. If you are going through persecution, cheer up. There is nothing that happens that will go beyond the power of the Lord to sustain you. The Lord will support you. The Lord will sustain you. And that thing you are going through will not destroy you in Jesus' name. We come to point number two. The persecution of Christ's faithful followers. I, uh, please come to Revelation chapter 2. I'm reading to you from verses 9 and 10. I, I know thy works and tribulation and patience, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give you a crown of life. The Lord will give you a crown of life. Now, uh, you see what the Lord is telling us here. He says, I know thy works. That word know. In the Greek, uh, uh, there are different words that are used for the word know. Here, uh, sometimes you can know something by observation. 
that is, you're looking at people, you're not participating with them, you're not going through what they're going through, but you know that thing because you observe. At other times, you have not observed, somebody told you. And then you can tell your friend, yes, I know that thing. How did you know? I was informed by information. But when Jesus Christ said, I know, he wasn't saying, I know by observation, or I know by information. He was saying, I know by participation. I am with you there. I know what you are going through. I'm going through everything with you. There is nothing that you go through that is not going through. There is no pain and there is no suffering and there is no persecution that you are going through that is not participating with you. That's why Jesus Christ was sending Saul, uh, Saul, who became Paul the Apostle. Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? What do you mean I'm persecuting you? I am participating in the persecution of those uh, children of God, of those disciples that you're persecuting. I know their persecution, not by information. I know their persecution, not by observation. I know their persecution by participation. And while you're persecuting them, you're persecuting me too. And so he said, I know, I know thy works. I know your tribulation. He implied a most intimate acquaintance with all that pertains to the church. In particular, he knew their tribulation. He knew their poverty. And he knew the blasphemy of the people, the opposers against them. Now when he said he knew their tribulation, that's what tribulation in the Greek just means, pressure. The Romans, they are the way of punishing people. And whenever they want to crush some people slowly to death, what they will do is to make a, to a, take a big rock, a big stone, and lay it upon their chest. And they will not be able to get up, and the thing will slowly, gradually, systematically crush them to death. And they use the Greek word that Jesus used here, that is translated tribulation. And it is the pressure, the pressure of a heavy load, of a heavy persecution heavy suffering and now what the devil wanted to do is to lay that heavy burden on them until it just needs life out of them i know your pressure and then it says i know your poverty when it says i know your poverty there are two words that is used in the original language for poverty and there is a kind of poverty that you're living from hand to mouth and you have to keep on walking to keep on eating because that is penury. You, you don't have too much. And if you, you have enough just to take care of yourself, to sustain yourself. But you still have to work tomorrow. So if you are going to take care of yourself tomorrow, that's poverty. There's another kind of poverty. That is a beggary. That is, you are so poor. And you have nothing, nothing, nothing at all. It is the worst level, the lowest level of poverty. And that's the word that Jesus used here. He said, I know your abject poverty, absolute poverty, and complete destitution. I know everything. And then when he says, I know the blasphemy of the people that blaspheme against you, is the word slander, reproach, piercing, painful insult. The abuse that you are heaping upon the people. And when people insult you, don't think that Jesus does not know. When people abuse you, don't think that Jesus does not know. Oh yes, he knows. He was saying that, I know number one, your intense pressure. Number two, I know your poverty. Number three, I know your persecution. But then he says, look at it in verse 9, but thou art rich. What does that mean? Thou art at reach. Uh, the Lord was telling them, was giving them a kind of revelation here. If you look at James chapter 2, James chapter 2, reading from verse 5, uh, you will see what the Lord implied when he said, but thou art rich. And if you are poor in material things, if you are poor and it appears there is no job, understand the riches that you have. James chapter 2 verse 5, Hacking my beloved brethren, has not God chosen the poor of this world rich in faith? Rich in faith, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to them that love him. Well, maybe you don't have money, but you have faith. Maybe you don't have health, but you have faith. Maybe you don't have the material things of this world, but you have faith. Maybe it appears that people are looking at you as if you are in abject poverty. And the Lord is saying, but you are rich. Because if you have faith, you can have every other thing. Rich in faith. The possibilities of faith. 
and the greatness of faith. And if things that faith can do in your life, if you join that faith with prayer, you'll come out of that situation and come unto the sunshine of all the provision of the Lord. Let's come back to Revelation chapter 2. In Revelation chapter 2, it says, I know your tribulation, your poverty, and the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Actually, what happened is this, uh, in the Roman world at that time, in all the cities controlled by the Roman emperor in the Roman Empire, and there was the worship of Caesar. And in the worship of Caesar, they'll say Caesar is Lord. When you do that, you'll go to the shrine, you'll go to the temple dedicated unto Caesar, and you'll worship. And then when you worship, you will burn incense unto Caesar. They did that because they wanted all the vast empire of the Roman emperor and the Roman empire to be totally united. And they wanted them to be united under a single figure, Caesar. And the only way they thought they could do that is to exalt Caesar to the point of deity. And so they will say, Caesar is Lord. When you do that and you worship in the temple, they will give you a certificate. It means that you have paid your due, you have done the right thing, you have worshipped Caesar, you have said, Caesar is Lord. If you are looking for any job, you are going to tender the certificate to show that you are a loyal citizen in that empire, a loyal citizen in that community. Guess what happened? The Christians said, Jesus is Lord. And they were not going to bow the knee to any other god, any other idol, any other deity. And they will not say Caesar is Lord. Therefore, they didn't give them the certificate. The certificate that will show that they have worshipped Caesar. And if you are going to get job, you must have that certificate. That gave them real problem. No job. And then, not only that, there was no security for them. Because everybody tossed them here and there. Because they thought they were the rebels in the nation. The rebels in the empire. Because they will not submit to Caesar. That's the reason they faced the terrible persecution. And now the Jews. The Jews who said that they belonged to God. And they were the people of God. They will go and worship in the shrine. In the temple of Caesar. And they will hold their certificate. And they will be the people reporting these believers in this manner. Saying they are not buying unto any other God. That's why Jesus Christ said, I know the blasphemy of the people that say they are Jews, and they are not the real Jews spiritually, but they are the synagogue of Satan. And it says, there's going to be suffering. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. The devil shall cast some of you into prison, that he may be tried, and that he may have tribulation ten days. What does that mean? Ten days. When the Lord said to these people, your problem will just be for ten days. And then you wonder, what did Jesus mean by that? Did he mean it will be literally ten days? It just meant that it will be very short. It will be very brief. If you study the Bible, you will see that whenever they mention 10 days, they were referring to just a short time. So, when Jesus said 10 days, that's just a brief time. If you look at uh, 1 Samuel chapter 25, I'm reading there to you from verse 38. It says, And it came to pass about 10 days after the Lord smote Nabal that he died. So brief time, short, short time. That he said, David was thinking it may take long time before vengeance will come upon this man and see how it came in such a short period of time. In Daniel chapter 1 verse 12, prove thy servants I beseech thee 10 days let them give us pulse to eat and water to drink. Just 10 days, that's a short time. And uh, the king is not going to make any quarrel with you. There's not going to be any much difference in 10 days. And then it says in verse 13, Then let our countenance be looked upon before thee, and the countenance of the children that eat of the portion of the king's meat. And as thou seest, deal with thy servants. So he consented to them in this matter to prove them 10 days. So when the Jewish people were thinking of a brief time, a short time. A short time that will pass before you even know it is come and it is gone. They'll talk about it ten days. When they get to the least, they feel this is the least. They say, well, that's all right. Ten days, we can manage that. Very brief time. You remember when Abraham was praying uh, about Sodom and Gomorrah. God, if you see 50 there, will you spare the city of 45 or 40 or 30 or 20? Or 10, when you read 10, it stopped. Because in the mind of the Jew, 
10 was the it was the least that we can talk about so that's why jesus said revelation chapter 2 verse 10 fear none of those things we thou shall suffer behold the devil shall cast some of you into prison that ye may be tried and ye shall have tribulation only 10 days just a brief time so just a short time and it will soon be over nothing to think about nothing to talk about there's no big deal in this only 10 days and it will all be over as you look at this passage you are thinking about what jesus said that there is persecution for the church of god and there is a tribulation or trial for the church of god it wasn't coming to these christians these believers by surprise because jesus had mentioned it in his earthly ministry in matthew chapter 10 reading from verse 16 behold i send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves, but beware of men, for they will deliver you to the councils, and they will scourge you in their synagogues. That's persecution, the scourging, the beating, and ye shall be brought before the governors and the kings for my name's sake, and for a testimony against them and uh, the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, take no thought how or what ye shall speak for it shall be given you in that same hour what ye shall speak for it is not ye that speak but the spirit of your father which speaketh in you verse 22 and ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake but he that endureth to the end the same shall be saved we will endure by the grace of God, in the strength of the Lord, by the Spirit of the Lord, we will endure to the end in Jesus' name. So, when it comes, you don't, don't be acting and be mourning and be weeping and be crying as if it's coming by surprise. The Lord had said it before, the apostles said it to you, that persecution will come. If you see what others have gone through, you will know that what you are going through is nothing in comparison with what other people have gone through. What did they go through? Look at this. In Hebrews chapter 10, reading from verse 32, but call to remembrance the former days in which after ye were illuminated ye endured a great fight of afflictions. Yours is not up to that. Partly while ye were made a gazing stock, both by reproaches and afflictions, and partly while ye became companions of them that were so used, for ye had compassion on me in my bonds and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods. It's not come to that for the majority of us, the spoiling, the destruction of your materials, knowing in yourself that ye have in heaven a better and enduring substance. Then he tells us, cast not away therefore. Therefore, because oh, you've gone through it, and others have gone through it, and what other people have gone through is much more than what you are going through. Don't cast away your confidence, which has great recompense of reward. For ye have need of patience, that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. For yet a little while, a little while, just ten days, just a brief time, just a short moment, for yet a little while, and he that shall come will come, and he will not tarry. He will not tarry. And when everything is over, you'll come to the other side and you'll be all right in Jesus' name. Already you see that this church was a church with no rebuke, no condemnation, no correction at all. It was a pure church in an hostile environment. Their persecution had perfected them. They were strengthened in their suffering. Life was dangerous in Smyrna because they refused to bow the knee to Caesar and because they refused to worship Caesar as deity, as a god, as an idol. The church in Smyrna was persecuted. They were rendered poor. They were denied their civic rights and they were blasphemed and, and slandered. Why? Number one, because of their unswerving loyalty to the Lord Jesus Christ. Number two, they were slandered. They were persecuted and they were rendered poor because of their uncompromising faithfulness to the world of God. Number three, it was because of undivided loyalty, undivided devotion to the Lord Jesus Christ. Number four, it was because of their opposition to the worship of, em of the emperor. Number five, it was because of their refusal to associate with the pagan Jews who professed to be worshiping God, but in reality, they were the synagogue of Satan. The church 
had every reason to collapse and backslide because of the pressure on them, because of the poverty, because of the persecution. They could have said, well, this is too much, but we, we cannot bear this again. They had every reason to collapse and to backslide, but they remained faithful. They remained faithful. You will be faithful. And they were rich in faith and rich in love and rich in grace and rich in holiness and rich in spiritual power. This poor, persecuted, pure church survived and is still remaining until this very day. Persecuted, yes, purified and preserved. I pray that in your persecution, in the pressure that comes against your life, you remain faithful unto the end in Jesus' name. We come to point number three, promise from Christ to the fearless and the faithful. And see what Jesus said in Revelation chapter 2. It says in verse 10, fear none of those things that thou shalt suffer. Brothers and sisters, if you are following after the Lord, and then the Lord is blessing you in your life, the people of the world are going to be jealous. And the people who are carnal are going to be jealous. And the people who are following the devil, they're going to be envious and jealous. And some persecution may come upon you. But understand, fear can be a deadly arrow from the devil. In fact, fear may even do worse than what the persecution is doing. That's why the Lord is saying, be not afraid. Be not afraid. It says, it tells us in Proverbs chapter 29, verse 25. The fear of man bringeth a snare, but whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be saved. When you are going through persecution, the persecution is enough. The pressure, the pain of the persecution is enough. If you add the fear of man to it, if you add the fear of the persecutor to it, that persecution is going to be unbearable. But if you just look on the face of Jesus Christ, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, and you are not afraid of your persecutor because you know Jesus is greater, because you know God is greater, and because you know God is watching over you, and God is moderating limits eating everything so that the sin will not destroy you and it's going to make you stronger at the end of the day then you'll be able to go through without any problem at all in Isaiah chapter 41 i'm reading to you from verse 10 fear thou not for i am with thee is that not enough i said is that not enough it says he is with you he will be with you be not dismayed for i am thy god i will strengthen thee yea i will help thee yea i will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness behold all they that were incensed against thee shall be ashamed and confounded they shall be as nothing they that strive with thee shall perish thou shalt seek them and shall not find them even them that contended with thee they that war against thee shall be as nothing and as a sin of naught for i the lord thy god i will uphold thy right hand saying unto thee fear not i will help you the lord will help you I said the Lord will help you. Now you have to make up your mind. Because he tells us in Hebrews chapter 13, verses 5 and 6, let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as ye have. For he has said, I will never leave you, nor forsake you. So that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man shall do unto me. You will not fear. You will not fear. You will not fear what man shall do unto you. Look at the promise of the Lord in Revelation chapter 2 verse 10. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that he may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give you a crown of life. A crown of life. You will have it. In First Corinthians chapter 9, reading from verse 25, And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now, they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I pray to others, I myself should be a cast away. And then the Lord said in Revelation chapter 2, reading verse 11, as he continued the promise that he gave to this church, it says, He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He that overcometh, 
shall not be hurt of the second death. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. What does that mean? Revelation chapter 21 verse 8. But the fearful and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and all mongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. The second death is the continuing death. That is separation from the Lord forever and ever. That's the lake of fire. But those who overcome will not get to hellfire. You will not get to hellfire. The Lord will preserve your life. The Lord is coming. When the Lord comes, he will come to take you away. That's why the apostle is saying that we should endure just for the moment that remains. He tells us that the rapture is about to happen. Because in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, the reading from verse 16, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise forth. Then we which are alive, you will be part of that number. And remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. When we are forever with the, uh, with the Lord, will there be persecution again? Will there be pressure again? Will there be problem anymore? So don't worry about the persecution. And while you are going through at this time, please remember, be not dismayed whatever be tied. God will take care of you. Beneath his wings of love, just abide there. God will take care of you. It may be through toil, through days of toil. When the heart is failing, remember God will take care of you. When dangers, fears, your pathway are sailed, God will take care of you. All you may need, he will provide. God will take care of you. Trust him and you will be satisfied. God will take care of you. Are you lonely? Are you sad? From friends separated? God will take care of you. He will give peace to your aching heart. God will take care of you now. No matter what may be the test. No matter what may be the trial. God will take care of you. Lean, weary soul, weary one. Upon his breast, God will take care of you. As you go home, remember, whatever you meet at home, whatever people say, whatever people do, God will take care of you. Through every day, over all the way, he will take care of you. God will take care of you. Rise up and let us pray. Don't be afraid. The Lord is on your side. The Lord will take care of you. He is the one that saved you. He is the one that brought you to himself. Whatever people do, whatever people say, whatever the pressure, whatever the poverty, whatever the persecution, God will take care of you.